Hello, um, this is my first upload to Patreon and um, my first video upload. So it's probably going to be quite brief because I just want to check that everything's working. But I just want to thank um, all of you for signing up. My intention is to do some more in-depth look at some of the things I talk about in my videos on TikTok. Um, so I was going to have a look at the Battle of Aleppo and how it relates to the Battle of Bakhmut now that all's said and done. Because I think it's going to give people a much clearer idea of of how Russia is engaging in this war. And I think that that is really, really important for us all to understand because it's from that basis that we can really know where this is going and 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 what's going to happen next um another video i really really wanted to do was a little comparison look at the end of the spanish empire and the end of the roman empire because a lot of people are saying that the situation we're in now is the end of the road is very like the end of the roman empire but actually Although there are some um, very clear, um, um, co not coincidences, sorry, I fall over my words a lot, guys, I do apologise. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot more clarity if you look at the end of the Spanish Empire and how they kind of overextended and and how that came to be. So I want to do both of those videos. As soon as possible i'd also like to do a weekly kind of roundup um and also myself and warren will be doing a zoom get together where we talk to each other um every every week or or twice a week um and i'll very much be uploading those here as well <clears throat> it's just nice to have a little bit of extra space but just for right now i've been looking quite a lot actually at the many layered defenses that the russians have built up over um the last few months in donbass in relation to the dam blowing and i kind of wanted to talk about it because i get very annoyed when people talk about the dam explosion as something that the russians would have caused and the only two reasons that seem to be given for the russians blowing the dam is one they're just evil and that's kind of what we all have to accept and two is that they wanted to stop the ukrainians from moving forward on their counteroffensive. now if you actually look <clears throat> at the situation with the counteroffensive, you have rather the offen the offensive lines, the defensive lines that Russia has. I find it very, very difficult to call it a counteroffensive because it's not. It's an offensive. OK, there is no countering. <laughs> it's it's not they're not countering an offensive. They're not waiting for the Russians to move and then countering. They are going on the offensive to try and reclaim um, these parts of the Donbass, which they've long since believed are theirs. Um, now, on that topic, I think one of the really important things to remember is that right at the beginning of this war in 2022, the Ukrainians had far better in information than the Russians. They had the American satellites, they had um, NATO mapping, they had all these geolocations of where the Russian troops were, and, blah, blah, blah. and it did really, really help them. But what's interesting is that none of that could match the Ukrainian people in Donbass who are largely on the side of the Russians, telling the Russians where the Ukrainians were and what they were planning. And, uh, and there's been an awful lot of death because of that. Um, an awful lot of civilians who have been told point blank blank to leave their homes even though they don't really want to they want to wait for the russians and or killed for potentially giving away these placements <clears throat> so
So the Russians have what we call dug in. They've dug in on three defensive lines and they have um, what we call anti-tank ditches, anti-vehicle ditches. So essentially great big carved out pieces of the earth that vehicles can't get over. That's their first line of defence. Their second are dragon's teeth, which are great big concrete pyramids that are set into the ground, which tanks really struggle to get over. And then their third line of defence is um, men in pillboxes and trenches in the ground. Now the Russia, the the Ukrainians, <laughs> sorry, the Ukrainians haven't actually managed to even get to the first layer of defence yet, and when it comes to the dam i really think we need to put to bed this idea that the russians wanted to stall the ukrainian offensive in actual fact the russians have been waiting for ukraine to go on the offensive for months and months and months they've dug in they've got their mines they've got their anti-vehicle you know ditches they've got their defensive lines they've got big old school tanks at the bank back that they're using as artillery they've got <coughs> you know air superiority the whole shebang and by all accounts the mood amongst the russian army has been when's this going to happen so that we can go on the offensive now the other thing to remember is that the guys who have been put on the um, the defensive line are actually different to the guys who are going to go on the offensive. Something that they haven't been able to do because of their own defensive lines. They've got fields full of mines. So for them, the further through those minefields the Ukrainians can get, the less work the Russians have to do to go on the counteroffensive, you see? So the idea that the that the Ukraine that the Russians would blow a dam to slow the Ukrainian offensive is wild because actually the best thing for the Russians is for the Ukrainians to come in on the offensive they can be picked off in small company sized amounts and then when the Russians go on the counteroffensive they've got less work to do that is a, a very clear method of attrition war. Now, I will go into the Battle of Aleppo in more detail, probably in a uh, an essay. But in the Battle of Aleppo, um, Assad and the Syrian governmental fighters were very, very much surrounded. And it was a siege. It was the siege of Aleppo by the Americans, Israelis, and the ISIS terrorist fighters that they had um, that they had paid, and Assad contacted the Russians, <clears throat> who sent Wagner. Now Wagner are the Russians' foreign military corps, essentially. The Russians have very very strict laws about who can go, you know, you know, the Russian Federation going abroad and being in war. So Wagner went into Syria. And what they did, again, is they laid very, very, very strong defences and they attacked the rear, okay? So they weren't worried about movements in the grey zone, uh, as we call it. They were worried about getting rid of the supply routes to supply those troops that they could then pick off at their leisure. And um, the siege of Aleppo was really long but fundamentally ended with the Syrians um, winning, despite being massively outnumbered, which is quite fantastic. Now, the guy who wrote the tactical analysis for this, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, has been given a, a place in the Russian army, you know, this is the difference between having military factions based on elitism, between having 
a kind of populist ideological political system if someone's good at what they do and they speak sense you give them a job doing that that's how the russians operate and it's worked for them very very well now the siege of bakhmut is very very similar but kind of in reverse so the russians have held up the troops in bakhmut and allowed Bakhmut to stay open as this place where troops keep funneling in and everything's focused there. And all the while that's happening and all those Ukrainian troops are being bogged down in Bakhmut, they're building up these defensive lines, which are like 30 kilometres deep. All right. Now, the strongest fighting, I believe, is involving about 21,000 Ukrainian soldiers all hitting in the same place and uh and this is quite wildly organized for the ukrainians because actually they're not the most organized of forces they um they don't even really have cohesive equipment or knowledge they've all been trained by different nato countries they've all got different nato equipment etc etc <clears throat> and the russians are really really playing to that but one of the biggest issues that the ukrainians have is that they are relying on a computer system that was developed which essentially tells them whether or not they will win okay and they're putting in all of these different figures and all of these different qualifiers about the russian army and what their strengths and weaknesses are and then they're trying to attack using that information a classic example is just recently in this counteroffensive, the Ukrainians decided to go in at night to attack because they wrongly believed that the Russians did not have um, infrared night vision. Now, yes, that was true of the Iraqis. And in fact, in Desert Storm, they made exceptional progress at night because the Iraqis didn't have night vision. But we know that the Russians do. So at some point, there's a real disconnect here where people aren't quite realising that this isn't a battle of a, a, a greater power and a lesser power. This is actually a battle against the Russians on their doorstep in their own backyard. And that's costing the Ukrainians greatly. Now... The only relevance that there would be to the Russians blowing the dam would be if they wished to halt the counteroffensive, so Ukrainians call it, or offensive, as you call it, if you're not daft. When actual fact, if you look at the evidence, the best thing for the Russians is the offensive. The worst thing for the Russians would be if they halted the offensive. Not because it would mean Russia would lose, but because it would mean Russia would lose more men going on the offensive into a defensive line. While the Ukrainians are moving forward, they are far more at risk. Now, I do say often that I don't know what's going to happen, but I can make some pretty good guesses. I think that... The second that the Ukrainians run out of steam on this offensive, the Russians will go on the counteroffensive. And as far as I'm aware, they have got brand new, fully equipped um, regiments prepared to go on the counteroffensive. So you're not even talking about battle weary men who have been waiting on the lines for this offensive to come through you're talking about brand new fresh out of training men ready to go on the offensive <clears throat> i believe they'll take odessa quickly and i also believe that they'll take kiev some people have got different views about that some people have got different views about the morality of that personally i believe that it would be morally irreprehensible for putin to leave a small state of Ukraine victim to the Americans. 
because that is what that would be. You're essentially saying this tiny landmass with no Black Sea port and no infrastructure or industry anymore has to repay this enormous debt to the Americans. For me, and I do kind of see this as a battle of good and evil, evil cannot win here. Money cannot win here. And the Ukrainians should be protected to not have to pay back the Americans for being used in a proxy war. If anything, the Americans should be paying back the Ukrainians. And I think the one person that will make that happen is Vladimir Putin. Um, now, obviously, much of this week has been dedicated to the Ukrainian counteroffensive. There's also been uh, some interesting geopolitical moves. China, I feel, has weighed in quite heavily with their comments about Palestine. I feel like Macron is showing more of his agent zigzag, schizophrenic, I don't know whether I'm coming or going, you know, do I want to fight Russia? Do I want to be part of BRICS kind of mentality? Um, and we are witnessing serious concerns from within NATO. Um, the Vilnius summit is next month. That's going to be really, really interesting. And fundamentally, a number of these small Eastern European countries and even quite large Eastern European countries are having to accept that their populations are not interested in entering into a hot war with Russia. Something that I think the Americans had not planned for. For years, and by years I mean since the Second World War, the CIA have been planting the seeds of Russophobia in these countries, trying to force these countries to fear the Russians to the point where they will fight them when the Americans say, say go. And, um, and although I think there is massive fear in these countries, the people do not want war. And when all said and done, that kind of needs to be respected. Um, I will do a more focused update tomorrow. I've rambled a bit today and I will, uh, and when my voice is back to normal and I will make some notes on some of the, the big points that have happened this week and expand on them a little bit more. But I wanted to put this video out and see whether that was the sort of thing you guys are looking for or if there's other things you want me to go through. I'm more than happy to do so. And I hope you will have a lovely day and thank you again for your support.